And this is our text for this morning. He is telling us that children matter to him. And in order to get a point across to some disciples and who uh, <laughs> had a, their own discussion going about what was important, <laughs> he takes a little child, grabs him up in his arms, and says, children matter. Children are important. And let me teach you by holding this child here. <laughs> Jesus is in the process of making disciples. <laughs> uh, yeah, several people talked about the food that they were making for this morning, making for the, in fact, Will's back there checking on his food right now to make sure it doesn't burn. So, so there's, you know, you, you make food, right? You, you mix things together and all. Well, Jesus is mixing things together, making disciples. It's a, the series that we're in, we're trying to look at this gospel, the gospel of Mark, to try to understand what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And not just a follower, but one who is doing what? Making other disciples. We want to follow the recipe. <laughs> and as we get into that this morning, we're going to see that what's really important to Jesus is he's trying to make disciples. Don't forget the Great Commission. Notice what it said, Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And then he's going to say very briefly what it's involved in making disciples. Baptizing them, which you just saw, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. To make disciples, you're teaching people to obey what Jesus taught and said. Incidentally, if you want to summarize that, it's really easy. Jesus, Jesus did it for you. He said, look, this is what it's all about. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you get those two points, you've heard what Jesus is trying to teach us to do. In Mark 9, then, our text this morning says, they left that place and passed through Galilee. What place did they leave, by the way? Well, this amazing moment that they've just experienced, they've been up on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus, right in front of their eyes, the glory of the Lord shone from him. Something that the disciples had never seen, and there's only three of them that are there watching, but it's something so incredible, they'd never seen it. God, Christ's body is keeping them from seeing the divinity inside of him. But he's still God, though he's in that human form. And the glory of the Lord shines so bright from him. And then Moses and Elijah come and visit with him. By the way, they head that back down the mountain after, <laughs> after Peter has his foot and mouth moment. <laughs> it's embarrassing, like, you know, I'm scared, I don't know how to handle this, so uh, let's build a bunch of tabernacles, Jesus. You know, I just, I... God comes, as incidentally, the third witness, Moses, Elijah, and God, all preparing Jesus for one thing, the crucifixion. Moses and Elijah come to talk with Jesus specifically about what is referred to as Jesus' exodus. Exodus? <laughs> That's a nice word for his, his death. They come to talk about the process he's going to go through as he dies on that cross. And then they head down the mountain. Jesus tells the three disciples that are there with him, don't tell anybody. They get down the mountain, at the bottom of the mountain, come back to the city, and here are the rest of the disciples, and the rest of the disciples are, are failing. They've been casting out demons in the past. They've been healing the sick. They've been preaching the word of God. They've been calling people to Jesus and to repentance. And a little boy, interestingly, a little boy has demons that are so attacking him that at times he will fall into convulsions and fall into a fire and nearly die. Or dad's afraid that that's going to happen. And Jesus comes up on the scene and this crowd is around this boy and the disciples because they have not been able to cast the demon out and the demon's kind of having a heyday with the disciples as well as the crowd. And so Jesus will take the little boy aside and cast the demon out and, and then the disciples later will say, well, why couldn't we? Why couldn't we take care of these? Some come only out through prayer and fasting. You've got to have, there's some that are a lot harder, some that's more work. And then they leave that place. And that's where we're at in our text. 
Jesus has cast out a demon from a little boy, healed him of this evil spirit, and now they're moving on. <clears throat> and they left that place and they passed through Galilee. And Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were. Why? Well, he answers that because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Incidentally, the phrase son of man is a favorite title that comes out of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament and here in Mark. Mark is, and it uses this title. Jesus uses this title for himself, calls himself the son of man which is a title for the Messiah. He says, Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. 1 Corinthians 1.23 says that the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews. Frankly, it was a stumbling block for the, for the disciples too, wasn't it? They don't get it. They hear him saying it. They hear him telling them that he's going to die, but it just doesn't fit with their concept of the Messiah. Messiahs don't die. I mean, how can they do their job? How can they set people free if they're dead? Once they're dead, they're gone. And so they, they, they have a problem with it. They don't understand it. <laughs> it's, it's a tough thing for them that they, they actually say, we're afraid to talk to Jesus about it. Scripture says that Christ is going to be delivered. Who is he delivered by? Well, Matthew 27, 26 says that Judas would deliver Jesus. How? He would deliver him over to the religious leaders. But that wasn't all who, who delivered him. Pilate delivers Jesus to the cross, right? Uses the same exact word. The chief priests and the religious leaders deliver Jesus to Pilate. There is a process of delivering, and don't, don't get off on, a, oh, it's just Judas that did it. Oh, no. In fact, the nation delivers Jesus to be crucified. Have you heard the phrase about somebody is in denial? People who sometimes get a... Uh, uh, was having a conversation this week, weren't we? <laughs> About, well, I, somebody was saying, you know, I, I'm not in denial. I, you know, I kind of know the truth about what I'm going through and all. But sometimes people, when something serious happens to them, they get, go into denial, pretend, you know, no, that's not going to happen. I've got cancer, but it doesn't matter, whatever, right? And then you can go into denial. Well, the disciples are in denial. They don't understand what he's doing. And in fact, Scripture says that it was actually concealed from them, Luke 9, 45, so that they wouldn't understand. The disciples are afraid to ask because they don't get it. Um, excuse me. By the way, maybe they're a little bit afraid because just a week or so earlier, <laughs> Peter has said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. P Jesus says, God showed you that, Peter. And guess what? Now I'm going to die. I'm going to be rejected by the chief priests and Pharisees. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to die and rise again in three days. Now, the problem was is that when they heard the word die, they didn't hear the rest of the story, did they? It's, it's kind of amazing, and you ought to do some kind of testing on this. See how often Jesus talked about the fact that he was going to rise again. And he was very clear about it. In three days, rise again. He said it straight out. But it's like, I'm going to die, and they got hung up there. But they're so hung up that like, what's he saying? This just, no, no way. And they know that the last time, Peter took him aside in a gentle kind of way. Jesus, messiahs don't die. You got it wrong, Lord. Just want us to kind of straighten you out, and that's why I'm taking you by yourself and helping clear things up. Messiahs don't die. You're not allowed to do that. Quit talking this way. Now, maybe they didn't want to ask him about this because of the way Jesus responded. Do you remember? Because Jesus turns back to the whole group, and he says, Get behind me, Satan! <laughs> now, was he called, calling Peter Satan? Well, <laughs> sure almost sounds like it, doesn't he? 
But what he's really saying is, look, I'm already facing enough temptation from Satan, temptation not to go to the cross. Don't talk this way to me. The things you're saying, Peter, are not the things of God. And don't, please, I'm, I'm tempted enough. I can't handle it. Don't, don't repeat those kinds of things. So maybe that contributed to the disciples. Jesus has just said, I'm going to be delivered, meaning betrayed. I'm going to die. And, oh, there's that die again. Now I can't hear anymore. And in three days, I'm going to rise again. And you talk to him. Not me. I'm not having him call me Satan. Well, how about you talk? Not me. And, and to top it off, three of them have been up on a mountain. Three of them have seen the glory of the Lord shining from him. Three of them have experienced the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son. This is the son I appreciate. This is the son I love. Listen to him. So John, you talk to him. Not me. He said, listen, and I'm not going to do any talking right now. I know what happened to you, Peter. And so they're all afraid. And there'll be some other reasons why they might have some fear as well. He was delivered. He will be killed. That's what he said. I'm going to be delivered and I'm going to be killed. That means his life's going to be taken from him by others. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. By the way, that's Mark 8. That's the conversation that Peter said. Uh-uh. You, you got it wrong, Jesus. But notice this other phrase. Now, it's easy for us to see, right? We all believe in the resurrection, so it's like piece of cake, you know. We all understand it fully, right? Jesus dies, rises from the dead, and yay, God, right? But do we, do we sometimes miss the depth of this as well? Mark 9, verses 9 and 10, as they were coming down the mountain, the mountain of transfiguration, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Oh, come on, surely they're getting it, right? You know, we've just been on the mountain, just heard the voice of God, saw the glory of the Lord shining from him. He's got to be more powerful than we think. But look what happens next. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing, uh, what does rising from the dead mean? <clears throat> they don't understand. Mark 10, verse 34. It's in our text that's coming up in a couple of weeks. It says, Who, the people will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. I'm thinking Jesus is repeating the same message quite a few times here, isn't he? but they don't understand it. And they don't want to ask him. Now, part of the reason why they don't want to talk to him about it is because what was going on as they were walking down the road. Did you see it in the text? Verse 33. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, hey guys, what were you arguing about on the road? I kind of want to get in on the discussion, okay? So, so what was it that you were arguing about? I have a question. What would embarrass you in front of Jesus? What would cause you to be embarrassed if Jesus asked you, hey, um, what were you talking about over at the store the other day? What were you talking about in the post office? What, what were you talking about with your neighbor? What, what were you doing on the internet? Late at night? Um, well, well, what were you doing when you were arguing with your spouse? What, what would embarrass you in front of Jesus? <laughs> the disciples didn't respond. It's probably kind of smart anyways, isn't it? <laughs> they were quiet. <laughs> They were quiet. <laughs> All of them were. <laughs> Luke 9, 47. says, Jesus knew what they were thinking in their heart. Uh-oh. 
What would embarrass you in front of Jesus? He knows <laughs> what's in your heart already. <laughs> hmm. Some of our thoughts, our conversations are shameful in front of Jesus, aren't they? Come on. Shouldn't we be embarrassed sometimes? You think about some of the things you think and say and do. The way you drive a car. Medications. I don't know. What, what is it in your life that, oh man, I, 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 I wouldn't want Jesus to be standing there watching. Here's the bad news. He is. They're coming down the mountain. Who's the greatest among us? Peter, James, and John, the three who went up the mountain. They're pretty special, aren't they? Yeah, we got to see the transfiguration. We got to see the glory of God shining. We got to hear God talking. And they walk up on the other disciples. You failures. You guys can't even cast out a demon. You should have been with us on that. But we can't tell you what we just experienced because Jesus said we're not supposed to tell. That's because we're so special and you missed out. So who do you think is the most important of all of us? Obviously, it's not the nine of you down here. Flunkies, right? Don't know how to deal with a simple demon. Can't even get it right down here. Here. well you should have been with us but we can't tell you about it can you imagine now surely not these 12 right I mean come on these are good church folk aren't they you know they, they don't compare themselves to anyone else right the, oh yeah and here's the sad thing what is Jesus saying to them I'm going to be delivered to evil people I'm going to be killed and I'm going to rise again and here's the really sad one. What was the conversation in the upper room when Jesus came to set up that first communion with them? What was the conversation as they entered that room and it had happened several times and we're going to see it happen more? What was their conversation? Who's going to wash feet? Not me. I'm more important than the rest of you. And an argument ensued. In fact, the argument really got tough because a mom joined the scene. And came in and said, Jesus, I want my two sons. I want them to have the right and the left side next to you. And all the other guys are saying, where's my mom? This is not right. She should be here too. I need to go get her. She needs to be speaking up for me. How did you? Oh, I can't believe that she beat us to it. And they were arguing about on the night before Jesus Christ is crucified, they're arguing about who's most important. Lord, help us. <coughs> and Jesus says, um, hey guys, what were you arguing about? On the road? Uh, I'm not telling. <laughs> And then Jesus does what a rabbi does. He sets down. Because when a rabbi teaches, they're not standing like we are. But a rabbi sits down and begins to discuss with them. And Jesus really wants to know if they truly want to be great. Matthew 20, verse 26. Not so with you. The world has one way, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Matthew 23, 11. The greatest among you will be your servant. So Jesus sat down and he took a little child whom he placed among them. And taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. I guess the question we probably need to ask ourselves today is, are we welcoming Jesus? Are you welcoming Jesus? <laughs> When Jesus explains that, he says, you do that by how you welcome little children. Why a little child? I mean, maybe he should have said, 
Do you welcome lepers? Or do, do you welcome the adulteress that we caught last week and were ready to stone? Do, do, you, do you welcome Pharisees? And Jesus takes this little child and says, whoever welcomes this child welcomes me. Matthew 18, verse 3, and he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. continues verse 4 therefore whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me after this service we ought to have a rush for people wanting to work with children think about it seriously if you want to welcome Jesus you would just take this and apply this little, these verses here, right? Well, what should you be doing? Welcoming children. Well, not me. Those are, they're brats. <laughs> they got too much energy for me. I can't, I can't control them. They're going to run around. No way. I'm not going to be with them. But wait a second. As you welcome a child, he's saying, you are actually welcoming Jesus. Frankly, what he's saying is you got to take the lowly position. But the disciples saying, oh, no, I, I'm, I'm important. I, I'm too important to work with kids. I mean, I'm trained. I'm sure glad I'm not going to say where my mind just went. Just laugh, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Jesus says, welcome me. Welcome me. And as you welcome me, you welcome my Father. And how do we do that? By being a servant. You see, and notice, it's not just about being here on worship and, okay, there's a guest, I'll go welcome them. Should we do that? Of course we should. Be friendly to one another, right? Welcome each other. Yes, we should do that. And in doing that, we do, in a sense, welcome Jesus, right? Don't wait here to welcome people. Welcome people into your home. Oh, not my home. It's a mess. Well, if it's that much of a mess, then clean it up, okay? <laughs> Just saying, okay? If that's the excuse you're using for not welcoming somebody in there, then do something about it. Because Jesus wants us to change our lives so that we can welcome people and welcome him. And guess what? If you're not welcoming somebody in your home, what are you missing out on? Welcoming, say it, Jesus. Welcoming Jesus. Oh, well, there's not room. Since Jesus is already there, there's not room for just me and him, okay, right? <laughs> you know what? Then make room. Buy a picnic table and put it outside or steal one of the benches from the church or something like that so that you can welcome people. <laughs> and in welcoming people, we welcome Jesus. So who, who are you welcoming? Like what Paul said in Philippians. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, Christ means anything at all to you. If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, if God's touched you at all, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And to bring it home, look how he continues. 
in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. How humble are you? How humble are you? Are you willing to be a servant like Jesus was? I believe it was Barclay or else John MacArthur who said, God is looking for humble people. Micah 6, 8 says, what does the Lord require of you but to walk humbly with your God? Luke 14, 11 and 18, 14, the Lord says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Barclay goes on, that is a spiritual principle. Ephesians 4, 1 and 2, where we are enjoined to walk worthy of the calling to which we are called is followed by walk with all humility. Colossians 3, 12, put on a heart of humility. And James 4, 6, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Finally, verse 10 of James 4, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. <laughs> In order to welcome, you need to become humble. How humble are you? By the way, one of the signs of insecurity is to draw a lot of attention to yourself. And we sometimes think, oh, Oh, well, I, I, and we start comparing ourselves to other people and, and we get really sensitive to ourselves and the bottom line is that's pride, not humility. How humble are you? Let me conclude with a few verses that take us back to the question a few moments ago. Are you welcoming Jesus? Matthew 10 said, anyone who welcomes you welcomes me and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Mark 10, truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Acts 17, 11, now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see what Paul said was true. They received the word of God and did something about it. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Are you listening to the Spirit of God? Are you welcoming Jesus in 1 Thessalonians 2.13? And we also thank God continually because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the Word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Are you welcoming Jesus. Be interesting to have you also stop and say, who do I not want in my home? <laughs> who do I not want to welcome into my home? Unless you welcome the little children you will miss out on welcoming Jesus. Father God, oh my, there's a test coming in just a few moments. <coughs> will we serve one another at the meal? Or will we be more concerned about what we get on our plate? But there's that cake over there that I, I, I gotta get it ahead of everyone else. Or maybe we came just because there's food and we're missing you. Don't let that be so, Jesus. Help us to welcome you and to serve you. 
and to serve the little children because they can't pay us and they probably won't praise us and we won't get a lot of credit from them but we'll get the joy of serving you. So help us, Jesus, to remember that in welcoming the child, in welcoming the people around us, we actually get the privilege to welcome you. And don't let us forget that